Well, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Bible Talk, coming to you this time live from West Tawakonee, Texas, just outside of Dallas. We're blessed to be here and blessed to be with you. I'm joined tonight by my lovely wife, Alice, and Hello. her sister, my sister-in-law, Mary Ellen. Hi. <coughs> Say hi. Hi, again. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're blessed that you can be with us, uh, as always, as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, the most radical sermon ever preached, the longest by Jesus Christ, near the beginning of his ministry when he first chose the apostles. And um, we're, we're focused right now in the Beatitudes. This is our eighth week in the study, uh, and the Beatitudes are Jesus' teaching on the behavior and the attitudes that we should have in our walk in righteousness mm -hmm. in our daily lives. So tonight we're going to be looking at this. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. That's Matthew 5, 9. And that's where we'll start. But before we do, I'm going to ask my lovely wife, Alice, to lead us in a prayer and ask the Lord's blessing upon us. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We praise you. We thank you for this opportunity and this time together for your word to go forth and to nourish our spirits and to encourage and strengthen us. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for your wisdom and your knowledge and your understanding that you give us through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We just bless you and praise you and we mm -hmm. love you. Amen. 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 Uh, again, I want to suggest to you that you, that you take time to take notes and most importantly, test the things that I say against the word of God. And spend time during the week talking to the Lord about what you hear here if something strikes you. Because it's those conversations that you have with the Lord when you hear Him speak to you that the Word will become real and vital and active in your life. Okay. You ready? Ready. And, and by the way, as I, I, wanted, I do want to say this in case you're joining us for the first time. All of the previous studies are available here online on BibleTalk.com. We post them after, after we do them live. They're made available on demand. So you can go back and watch them. You can invite others to come watch them. And we also encourage you to write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions, any comments, any suggestions you might have. We would love to hear from you. Okay, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, a, a peacemaker... Is a, and then I, you know, I start many of these with a dictionary definition, and I'll start that way tonight. A peacemaker is a person, group, or nation that tries to make peace, especially by reconciling parties who disagree, quarrel, or fight. Okay? Right. Peace is the opposite of war. Right. But I think that, uh, and that's one of the things we'll discuss tonight, how many people really understand either what war is or what peace is. Because we have very worldly views coming into this. All right? <clears throat> Jesus Christ said that he who is not with me is against me. Mm -hmm. That was in Matthew 12, 30. So it's like an on-off switch. You know, one of the things that we found out in the world in, in my lifetime and generation is very almost anything can be expressed as on or off. That's how computers work. Right. It's either on or off. Mm -hmm. And from that, you can make virtually anything happen. Well, we as humans have been convinced to live a lot of our lives, have our ideas and beliefs in some gray area that falls between on and off. Mm -hmm. But Jesus and the Word is very clear that it is one or the other. You are either for me or you are against me. There's no in between. There is no in between. So I wanted to start this study on peace in Ephesians chapter 2, just referring to Ephesians chapter 2. And I really suggest that you take time during the week to read that chapter. Because in this entire chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he's dealing with the fact that we, all mankind, were separated from God the Father. We were enemies of God. When Jesus came and through His atoning work 
reconciled us to Him, making us friends of God. There's that word reconcile, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what peacemakers do. They reconcile. reconcile. Jesus, and, and this is what the Scripture says. In Romans 5.10, Paul wrote, and he said, For if while we were enemies, and that's what we were, we were enemies of God. Mm -hmm. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Okay? Uh, our last trip here to, to Waukenee, Texas, was a couple of years ago, to do a baptism of Mary Ellen here in the lake, in Lake yes. Tawakany. Mm -hmm. And the song that she chose as kind of her baptism song was a song, I Am a Friend of God. That's right. Well, this is one of the great blessings that Christians should have an understanding of. Because, you know, Jesus said that in, in John 15, that now He calls us friends. That's, a, that's the opposite of enemies. Alright? So this is, again, it's, it's peace or war. It's friend or enemy. No gray, great big gray area in between. So if you look at what Paul writes in Ephesians and what he wrote here in, uh, in Romans, then you'll understand when he says in Ephesians chapter 2, speaking of Jesus, that He Himself is our peace. Jesus is our peace. We don't get this from the world, all right? And it's important to understand this going in like many of the Beatitudes that we've talked at and looked at in the past. You can't give what you don't have. And you don't have in yourself anything good. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. But it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given in every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. That's James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. So every good gift, this peace that we have, is a gift that has been given to us by God. Right? Jesus said, I mean, you can't bring peace. You can't make peace. You can't bring peace. You can't have peace. And you'll never have real peace unless you have received it. But Jesus said, in John 14, 27, He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. You see, it says that the, 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 we're supposed to be sowing things. right? And we're, we're going to talk about the fact that one of the things that we as Christians are supposed to be sowing in the world is peace. But it's God who supplies seed to the sower. It's not something that we generate in and of ourselves. It's what God has given to us that we then pass along to the world. Well, it's not natural for man to be at peace. Oh, no, we're going to surely talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but because it is natural for, for us to be at war, for mankind to be at war. Right. But I just wanted to use, you know, Paul said, I've determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. The cross is the center of human history. Yes. Right? But I want to talk about the cross as parable for me when it comes to peace. Because peace is about your relationships. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. When you're at peace with somebody, you have a good relationship. When you're at war with somebody, that's not a good relationship. Mm -hmm. So let me just talk to you a moment and, and show you the cross as a, as a parable, so to speak. Let me zoom in here a minute so you can see my incredible hand-drawn artwork. artwork. This is a picture of the cross. Uh, of course, you all know what the cross looks like. But I want you to see something here. The cross consists of two pieces. Mm -hmm. The vertical bar which is, was planted in the ground, right? Yes. That represents the relationship between God up here and man below. Because first, and what's grounded, has to be man's relationship with God. And then the horizontal bar, right here, mm -hmm. that represents man's relationship with other men. But if this is not supported by the relationship between God and man, it falls to the ground and collapses. Now, I mean, this is really, really important to get an understanding of, because what that, what that means is that unless there is a relationship with God to support the relationship, you will never have a right relationship with man. It will collapse. Right. It will always collapse and fall to the ground. So this is really, really important, and of course, obviously, the world can't understand this that every human relationship has to be supported by a relationship between individuals and God. Mm -hmm. 
Okay? Does that make, make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because this is why when we talk about being peacemakers, you cannot go out and bring end conflict between men until those men end the conflict they have with God. Yes. All right? Right. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my age here. I'll give away my age. Do I still look cute? Okay. You guys are supposed to cheer me on or something. All right. I'm a war baby. I'm what was called a war baby. That's right. I was born in 1943 in the midst of the Second World War. A, a horror. I mean, it engulfed the world yes. and was responsible for the death of millions upon millions upon millions of people, right? Mm -hmm. I was born into that environment. When I was a young child in grammar school, I remember I went to a Catholic grammar school and each day we would go to, to church to pray for the soldiers right. who were fighting in Korea. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because that was a, that was a horror. Yes. The, this war that was going on in Korea. Then when finally a ceasefire was declared in Korea. And by the way, there has never been a cessation of that war. It never ended. There has been a ceasefire, mm -hmm. but the war has never officially ended. Okay? But after that, so then I spent the balance of my grammar school and then into my high school days listening to the regular testing of air raid sirens. I can remember this. Every Friday at noon, the air raid sirens would go off and we had to make sure that they worked. Mm -hmm. And we would all jump under our magic wooden desks. I mean, I went to school just outside of New York City. You know, and we had, in our Catholic school, we had these little wooden desks and we'd jump under them because that would protect you from the nuclear bombs that were going off all around you. Okay. But that was the, the environment that I was growing up into, from, you know, into my adulthood from. Mm -hmm. When I got out of there, I went to the, to the U.S. Navy. I joined the U.S. Navy to fly. And I joined the U.S. Navy in the early 60s just in time for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Mm -hmm which was about that close, brought us to the brink of nuclear war with Russia, between the United States and Russia. Mm -hmm. okay. I was flying patrols around Russia, as a matter of fact, in the Navy, watching for the ICBMs, the Intercontinental, uh, Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, to come flying, and that was my job, was to fly patrols around Russia in anticipation of a nuclear missile attack. Mm -hmm. I married Alice, my lovely bride Alice. By the way, yesterday was our anniversary. Ta da! 44 years and five months. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But we, we got married in the 60s. Mm -hmm. 67. Yes. In 67, to be exact. Most of you are, I'm sure, not old enough to actually remember this. But when Alice and I got married, we lived in a country that was at war with itself. Mm. You could turn on, I mean, this was a time of assassinations in the 60s when John Kennedy was assassinated, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, and there were so many political assassinations. But more than that, there were riots all through that period, based on politics, based on race. And I, when Alice and I got married, I mean, you could turn on the television at night and watch smoke rising. It looked like the Second World War all over. Watch Detroit burning, watching Los Angeles burning, watching Newark burning. Watching city after city burning around the United States. I don't know if this is taught in history today, but I mean that was the environment that, that I grew up into, that I was you know born into, that I grew up into, that Alice and I were married during. I mean millions of people around the world watched city after city burning in the United States of America. It was not a pleasant time. And they had to send out. I mean, even you know, we're coming into, we're in this political period right now. Yeah. I'm sure not many of you are old enough to remember the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago mm -hmm. when they had to send soldiers into the streets That's right. to control the rioters. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was horrible. Now, today, is it better? Today I live in a world, you live in a world, we all live in a world that is absolutely dominated by rumors of wars and rumors of wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is incredible. So, let me just tell you this. War is something that lives in the heart and manifests in the flesh. Mm. Or, it should be with us who have been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb that love lives in the heart and manifests in the flesh. It's either one or the other. 
There is no in-between. There's either peace or there's war. It's always one or the other, and it's rarely, if ever, peace. Sometimes the war is cold. I don't know quite what that means. I mean, you know, there's not shooting and the bombs aren't quite going off yet. But it's still war. Those of us who were old enough to live through the Cold War with Russia, which, by the way, hasn't gone away. It just kind of got put off for a while. Know that it brings that conflict and tension that is the, the symbol of war. All right. It's... It's hardly ever peace because it's always a temporary ceasefire. Right. All right. What passes for peace in the world is generally just one or both of the different sides taking time to reload. Right. That's, that's a fact. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. There is war going on. There's, of course, there's wars going on all over the world. I mean, look at the United States of America has been involved for 10 years in, in two different wars mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and Iraq. But there are wars all over Africa. There have been wars, I mean, all over the place. There are, you know, there have been resurgences of the violence in, between Ireland and Northern yes, Ireland. Right. I mean, there, there's... It's quiet for a while. Because it is a natural condition of the world to have this strife and conflict all over. Why? Because John wrote and said that this present world is in the power of the evil. Right. And he is a god of confusion. And war is the ultimate chaos. It is the exact opposite of peace. What is peace? I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, I don't want to be too controversial here. I really don't. But I think it kind of exemplifies our lack of understanding of peace. If you want to see this, I mean, you only have to go as far as our own White House. No, okay? I, I just got to say it the way it is here. Barack Obama was in office, I believe, 11 days. Less than two weeks. When he was nominated, for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009, and then was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Not for anything he'd done, because he hadn't done anything. But, you know, the controversy that arose after that, and controversy did arise after that, was that basically the understanding was that the Nobel Committee awarded him the Peace Prize for what they thought he might do. Well, that's pretty sad. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty sad. Um, that was no, nothing like that has ever happened before. No, nothing ever happened. You know, but the, the reason why was he ran on a campaign of two words, basically, hope and change. And I'm going to tell you, especially I'm speaking to you, my brothers and sisters, the world is desperate for change. Yes. And there is such hope for change. Because when all is said and done, people recognize how bad the situation is. And yes, it hits home. It doesn't have to be armies versus armies. No, no. You know, what we've been through here with the Occupy movement, that's conflict. Alice and I, we spent a lot of time overseas in our ministry. Last year, during the summer, we were in, in England. We were in Manchester, we were in London, when the riots took place there. That's war. That's right. It may not be soldiers in the streets, but it's, it's bloodshed and open warfare in the streets that goes on. And it's like, okay, you know, it happens and it's, it's, it's going. It's not going. Because the tension that brought that into being is still there. And I'm going to say this, and, you know, I know that it says that the natural man does not, cannot, accept the things of the Spirit of God for they're spiritually appraised. But the spiritual man appraises all things. The only hope for peace between two men is you and I. Because we bring the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus Christ in every situation. And He's the only hope for peace. There is no other hope for peace. But meanwhile, the world is looking at every place. There was, there was a country and western song. Um, I, I'm not into country and western music, even though I'm here in Texas. I should be able to... Tex Texas? Well, I was in Nashville. Oh, yeah. Well, we just came from... As a matter of fact, we were just up in Nashville. That's and we just before we came here to Texas, um, but it was it came from the movie Urban Cowboy with John Travolta, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the song became kind of the hit out of that movie was um, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, that's what's happening is people are looking for love in all the wrong places. They're looking for peace in all the wrong places. 
because the UN has now been in existence for virtually my entire lifetime, right after the Second World War. We still don't have peace. No, that's right. It's, we it's, don't have peace. They have failed at that. Job. That was the best attempt at man, all the nations coming together to provide peace. But look at the conflicts that we have had since the end of the Second World War throughout the globe. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first and worst war took place many, many, many years ago. You'll not be able to trace this on your calendar. It's when Adam and Eve sinned. Mm -hmm. Because Adam's sin, and listen to what I'm saying to you, because this is very important. That was an act of aggression against God. Mm -hmm. Now we don't tend to see I hit a note, I hit a chord with the door. <laughs> I'm getting an amen from the door. <laughs> this is real, this is live and in color, so hallelujah. And that was Benji. <laughs> yes. It says that the righteous man cares for his beast and we're going to go out and preach the gospel to all creation. So the dogs are invited to sit in and participate. Uh, as long as I don't lose my train of thought. So, I don't think we tend to see sin as an attack on God. But it most assuredly is. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that if we had a clear vision of sin, we would be less likely to do it. I mean, you know, we're not supposed to sin. And hallelujah, if we do, we have, we have this. We can, if we're faithful to confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins. But we need to remember that there's always consequence to sin. There's always consequence to sin. And one of the consequences to sin is the punishment of Jesus Christ. Right. It was for your sins, it was for my sin that the skin was whipped off his back. It was for your sin and my sin that a crown of thorns was placed on his head, that he was spit upon, that he was mocked, and finally that he was nailed to a cross. Our sin is an act of aggression against God. I don't think we see it that way. No. David did. Now David was a man after God's own heart. And David said in Psalm 51, he said, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. He's speaking, he's crying out to God and saying, Against you, I have sinned. It's an act of aggression against God. That sin by Adam and Eve was then followed by one of the most bitter, yes. bloodiest, mm -hmm. widespread wars the world has ever known. Perhaps it was the when Cain killed Abel. That's right. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, and you know, looking at Scripture, at that point in time, there's only Cain and Abel. I mean, you got Adam and Eve, but there's only Cain and Abel. So mm -hmm. the entire youth, you've got a war that takes place between two brothers. It's the, the whole world is engulfed in war. Why? Well, mankind's been battling ever since. War is hard. Sometimes, you know, we tend to glorify it. We glorify it in, in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, again, and I understand this, you know, when I was young, during the Second World War, and right after the Second World War, Hollywood pumped out movie after movie after movie. You know, the John Wayne thing. And I, listen, I, please believe I'm not speaking against these people, but it was propaganda. Mm. It was there to pump us up. Right. They were doing the same thing in other places. Um, you know, Hitler, he had uh, Goebbels or Gehren, a master of propaganda, to pump the people up and get them enthusiastic for war. Mm. May it never be that we are enthusiastic for war. Because I want to tell you something. We serve the Prince of Peace. The Bible teaches us, and history demonstrates, that the only way that you'll have real and lasting peace, the only way it'll exist, is when one party is victorious because the other party is either annihilated or they surrender completely, totally, and unconditionally. And that's what he calls us to do. Aha! Aha! That's exactly... Actually, what God calls us to do is both. To be annihilated and to surrender completely, totally, and unconditionally. 
After all, I'll go back to David again in Psalm 51. He said that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. You will not despise. We Christians came to peace with God when we surrendered and then died. And I, I, I do want to say this, and I want to zoom in for this guy. If you did not surrender completely, totally, and unconditionally, then you have yet to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And you're still at war. You may not realize it, but to the degree that you hold on to your own life, you are in conflict with God. Jesus said, right? He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake he is the one who will save it. So Paul can go on later and say, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So that you can have new life. You surrender and you die so you can have new life. This is why, this is why Jesus said to Nicodemus, don't be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. John 3.3. 3. I'm thinking about that um, verse where unless a grain of wheat shall, shall fall, fall into the ground and die, shall remain but a single grain and not give yeah. life. We come to peace with God when we have died, surrendered, died, and come into new life. All right? Now, I know, and you know, if you've been a Christian more than an hour or two, the truth of what Paul talks about when he says that there is still constant conflict between our flesh and our spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to see this, and, and again, if you haven't spent time lately in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8, and you see the depth of this battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. That's warfare. But it's a different kind of warfare. And it's a warfare that Christ has given us victory over. And that's why he can say that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and we'll get into this because, you know, it says, Blessed are the, the, the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Well, it is there in Romans 8, after Paul talks about this conflict in his own life, ongoing conflict, that God gives him victory in, that it says that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. War is the natural state of man. Not the spiritual state, it's, a, it's the natural state. So, right, so the, the, you have to understand and know that we have been saved from war. And we serve the Prince of Peace. That's what it says in Isaiah 9. I, I just love this. The, you know, when God speaks through Isaiah to say He's going to give, there will be a son born to you. You should call Him Wonder Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. That was a nice song too, huh? And you shall call Him Wonder Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father. Prince of Peace. I told you, one of these days we're going to get a choir. Okay. But you have to have it. You have to understand that we serve the Prince of Peace. I, I did a teaching a number of years ago in California. Yes. I was just I was thinking about that when you were talking about the war of the flesh and the war in the spirit. And the war in the spirit, God does the battle for us. Uh, well, we talk, yes, absolutely. God will always do the battle for us. Well, you know, and there's a, there's a key to the success here. Please remind me, so I don't forget to do this, from Isaiah. Mm -hmm. uh, that, those verses yes. that I love in Isaiah, mm -hmm. where we're cheerleaders, yes. right? Yes, Right? But we serve the Prince of Peace. I started to say, you know, I did a, uh, a teaching in California in a church, and they asked me to talk about spiritual warfare. I said, well, the first thing you have to understand is that we serve the Prince of Peace. If you have a heart for war and a natural... Well, you better get back on your face before God and understand who you're out there serving. Because the Word says, Hebrews 12, 14 says, we are to pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. We've got to pursue peace with all men. And then it says, Paul says in Romans, never 
pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Now, the fact of the matter is, it doesn't always depend on you. No. I mean, other people can and will choose to war, have conflict with you. You can't control their actions, but you are called by God to control your response to their actions. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, and I've said this before, you know, basically, the Sermon on the Mount is the Beatitudes. And the balance of it is commentary on the Beatitudes. So when he talks, when Jesus talks about loving your enemies, yes. all right, I mean, this is the response. We can't control their action. We can control our action. We can control our response. But it should be your heart's desire. It should be the burning desire of your heart to be at peace with all men. Our warfare is not against flesh and blood. And the weapons of our warfare are not, are not carnal. They're divinely powerful, right? So the key is there, so much as it depends on you. It's not your, in your power to control the actions of others, but it's totally in your power to control your response. When somebody takes a parking place that you're just ready to get into, yeah. that's a good time. Yeah, you, know, you, you may not see that as war, but it's yeah. conflict. Yeah. Yeah. It's conflict. But that, that's why I say we don't understand when God is talking about war. It's conflict. Because peace is the absence of that conflict. You can't stop that person from cutting you off. But you can stop, you can control your response. And you can bring peace. If you can't bring peace to them, you can certainly bring peace to you. And this is what Paul talks about when he says we're called to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And then peace will begin to reign in your heart. And that peace will not be able to be removed by the, by the actions of the enemy. Because you know what? It's not the people. They're in the power of the evil one when, they, when they're acting like that. Right? The warfare is... God, it was never God's intention for us to be a people of war. No. You know, it was, if, you, if you go back into the beginning when God called His people, formed His people, literally, in Egypt, right? Now, He had made the promise to Abraham... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? right? But it's in Egypt that he forms the people into a nation. Right. It was the fear of war that caused the Pharaoh of Egypt to harshly mistreat the Jews in the days just before the birth of Moses. That's what it was. It says that in Exodus 1.10. See, he was afraid that if Egypt went to war, the Hebrews would join the enemies so he harshly, that's a, that's a good way to take, that's a good response, right? And then when God, through the mighty hand of, of Moses, leads the people out of Egypt to take them to the promised land, mm -hmm. he leads them by the way of the Red Sea. Yes. He brings them to an impossible, impassable body of war. Why? He said, so that they would not see war. That's what he said. Mm. Exodus 13, 7. Well, that's why he brought them that way. He that's brought them that way so they would right. not see war. Right, right, right. right? What's, what is the source of your quarrels? What's the source of war? What brings war? Well, James 4. I'm going to read to you from James 4, verses 1 to 4. What is the source of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God pretty powerful. Well, it is powerful. I mean, you know, we started this Bible said, the last thing in the world you want to be is an enemy of God. What you want to do is be a friend. But here's the deal. He's saying you can't be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. you got to make that choose. choice. It's a one or the other. Now, you're going to have to have some maturity to understand. That doesn't mean you go out and start fights with the people in the world no. because they're not the enemy. No. But it's your pleasures, your lusts. It's the things that the world tries to attract you with to draw you, to distract you from the things of God. 
The Word of God says we're to set our minds on the things above. But Satan, he took Jesus into the wilderness and tried to get him to set his mind on the things below. He showed him all the glories of the earth and said, you bow down, you can have all of this. He wants us distracted. He wants us divided. And war is the ultimate division. Okay, so again, the Bible teaches and history demonstrates that enmity between men cannot be replaced by real peace until those men have made their own peace with God. Although their warfare may ebb and flow like the tides, it will continue on and on and on. A number of years ago, a, long, a great number of years ago, Alice and I were in a mall in New York. And it was, in, it was fairly late in the evening. And the mall was not crowded. And there were a group of young people. I say young people, probably 19, 20 years old, 20 years old. That's young to me, especially now. <laughs> and there, I don't remember how many there were, but there was a, a bunch of teenagers. And all of a sudden, I mean, Alice and I were standing there, and two of these guys just went, they, they, all of a sudden, they just went at it. They started duking it out in the middle of the mall. And interestingly enough, because in New York they have security guards there, mm -hmm. yeah. and the security guards turned and choom, beat feet. They, they, yeah. they, they found, yes. they were busy someplace else. They saw it happen, and they yeah. turned around and went the other direction. Mm. So I went over, and I stepped between these two guys. And one of the guys had a cross on, a very common decoration, not a declaration. Mm. So I stood between them, and I went up, and I just I hit the guy right in the I said, what are you wearing this thing for? Mm. And he said, what? And so they, they stopped fighting, and I, I started to share with them. Now, one guy, the one guy walked away. Yeah. The other guy stood there, and it was like, he's just sucking this stuff in, soaking it up. Mm -hmm. So I talked with him, and I started sharing the Lord with he him. With and, and he started walking with me. And I said, okay, you think about this. So I started to walk away, and the guy comes running, the guy that had been in the fight with him, I see him running from like 20 yards away, Adam. So again, I went over and I, I threw a little body block on him. The fact is, the one guy, he was there and just eating up the gospel. But that didn't stop the other guy from being aggressive. Mm -hmm. You can't control it. Right. But the fact is, if, if those two people, if, if Joe and John are fighting, mm -hmm. and Joe and John don't make peace with God, they'll never, ever, ever peace with each other. have peace with each other. That goes back to that thing I was talking about before with the cross. Unless there is a foundation to hold something fast that goes vertical from man to God, God to man, you'll never support a relationship between people. Now, I got to tell you, this is so important today when family life is basically destroyed, not only in the United States of America, but every place that we go. Because the only solution to that is a right relationship with God for each of those people. You can do all the counseling, you can do all of the stuff you want, but unless there's a right relationship with God, there will never be a right relationship with those people. Parents, if you don't have a right relationship with your children, you better start giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because until they make peace with God, they'll never have true peace with you. I'm telling you the truth. And like I said before, you think about this, you pray about it, you ask God about it. I'm telling you that the Bible teaches this and history demonstrates it. If you, if you have any honesty in your heart, you will look at the world around you and know that what I'm saying to you is the truth. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be, shall saved. be saved. Amen. He is the only hope. But conflict goes on. Yes, I mean, if it's not resolved, it just continues. And like I said before, it may ebb and flow, right. but it's there. I think one of the great examples between this is, I'm going to go back again into Genesis. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord found Hagar. Now remember Hagar? Yeah. She was the slave of Sarah and Abram. Right. And when Sarah didn't have a baby, she gave Hagar to Abram, Abram yeah. to have a child. Mm -hmm. And he does. He has a child with her, and the child is Ishmael. Yeah. Now after that, because of the jealousy, Sarah sends her away. She goes off. And the angel of the Lord comes and finds, we have a new guest. Yes. The angel of the Lord comes and finds Hagar. <clears throat> and he spoke to her, telling her that her son Ishmael would multiply greatly. It wasn't just Isaac. Right. 
that Ishmael would multiply greatly. And he went on to say this, he, Ishmael, will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of his brothers. That's Genesis 16, 12. Now, Islam today agrees and teaches that Ishmael is the forefather of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And that Islam comes from Ishmael. Mm -hmm. It ain't over. No. No. It's not over. This goes back to the book of Genesis. Yes. There, this is not new. What is going on in the Mideast did not start when the Palestinians did this or that. No. What the battle that is going on did not start when Israel became a state in 1948. This battle did not start any time in your history. It started thousands of years ago with Ishmael, right. and it's been going on ever since. And you want to know something? The only way there will be peace is when a Muslim accepts the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. He'll never make peace outside of that. Right. Now, that may not be politically correct to say that, but it happens to be the truth. And I have seen it be the truth. Yes, absolutely. And by the same token, and I say this and I have a great love for Jewish people. I have a great love for Israel. But the fact of the matter is when I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I know His name. Yes. And His name is Yeshua HaMashiach. That's right. He is the promised Messiah of Israel. Yes. And without Him there will never be peace, and He'll be the one that brings peace to the nations. Yes. Okay. But this peace mm. that we have received, because you've got to receive the peace, yes. you have to preach the peace, and you've got to bring the peace. Receive. The Word of God, the Word of God says, from whom much has been given, much is required. God has given us peace. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we earned, it's not something we deserved. It was a free gift from God. We have been given much. We are required much. And what we are required to do is to take that peace and bring that peace to others. All right? So that's the second half of this verse. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be... Well, unless you're Bill Clinton. Mm, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Sure. Bill Clinton. Oh. I go back to another president of these United States because in 1995, then President William Jefferson Clinton, I'm not picking on you. Hey, Bill, if you're listening to this, give me a call. I'm not trying to pick on you. But the facts are the facts. When he was trying to bring peace between Israel and Jordan, and he had the president of Israel and the king of Jordan together, he said, he quoted this scripture, and here's what he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh -oh. <laughs> Yo, Bill! Ain't so, brother! No. It just ain't so! I wonder, you know, here's a guy who was supposedly at some point in time teaching Sunday school in a Baptist church. Did he, did he make an error, or did he intentionally change the scripture so it would not, to be politically correct, so it would not offend? That's right. Because for him to stand in front of a Jew and say that that Arab will be a son of God. of God, or for him to say to the Arab that the Jew was a son of God, ain't going to go, ain't going to fly. Mm -hmm. So perhaps he intentionally changed the scripture. His advisors to, advised him. To make it more politically correct. Yes. But that's not what the scripture says. Yeah. What the scripture says, and what the scripture says, by the way, and to my King Jamesy friends out there, and i got a lot of my King Jamesy friends, it says children of God. That, that you should be called children of God. I want to tell you that that word throughout the King James Bible is virtually translated sons. Mm -hmm. Now th this is important because this is God's purpose in our life. That whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. Right. Regardless of your sex out there, whether you're male or female, right. God is conforming you into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. And that word son is very, very important. And we just went through a thing, I don't know if you followed it or saw it on Bible Talk, maybe a month ago or so, where a couple of the most reputable, credible, Bible translating organizations yes. in the world were coming out with translations that removed 
the word father, remove the word son from scripture because some people found it offensive. Well, to the best of my knowledge, after a lot of people contacted them, including us at Bible Talk, they have repented yes. of that and changed. Yes. yes. Okay. But the purpose is that what what's happening is that when we act as peacemakers, when we bring into a situation that which God has given us, the peace that passes understanding that only Christ Jesus can give, mm -hmm. we are imitating the Son of God. Yes. And the Father sees us as sons of God. Hmm. When the Son of God was born in Bethlehem, I mean, it's, you got to think about how all this ties together, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've always said Scripture interprets Scripture. Yes. Right? Yes. When He was born in the fullness of time in Bethlehem, mm -hmm. it says that the angels and the heavenly host who were appearing to the shepherds, they rejoiced, praising God, saying, Peace on earth. That was peace, peace on, on earth. earth, was the Jesus. birth of Jesus Christ. Yes. We have been given this great gift, mm -hmm. the Prince of Peace. And then Jesus, like I said, he, what he said, Jesus said, from everyone who has been given much, much is required. We've been given this great peace. It, we have a responsibility to bring great peace. Our ministry on earth. And when I say our, if you have been saved by the shed blood of the Lamb on that little hill in, outside, outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, I'm talking about you. Our ministry is peace on earth. Not warfare. You see, our warfare is in the Spirit. Not, not, against, flesh not against flesh and blood. That's exactly what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Go back. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6, 12. And the weapons of our warfare, he wrote again in the, to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. See, we have a different ministry than the governors, right? The government, who are, Peter said, sent by God for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. That's their ministry, to punish evildoers. I don't have any problem with that. That's not our ministry. Our ministry is not judgment and punishment. No. Our ministry is grace, mercy, righteousness. Mm -hmm. These are the things that are our behavior and attitudes that are expressed in the Beatitudes. These are the things that we are to bring into the world. All right? We have a different ministry than the governors who are sent for, by the, for, the, by, for the punishment of evildoers. For the ruler, Paul wrote, does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So, in the world, you have the, a, a government that has a ministry to protect us from evildoers and to punish evildoers. That's not us. Now, a lot of the old Bible comment, commentators, now I, I, I looked at some of the, you know, a lot of these guys over the years, I'm talking about the old ones. I'm talking about like Barnes, Matthew Henry, Gill, Wycliffe, you know. And, and they state, they think that the primary focus of this verse is on us bringing peace between men. And I say again, that because there can't be peace between men until there's peace with God, by those men. We're supposed to bring reconciliation. Ah, so that God. the, right, the focus of Jesus' teaching here is that we bring the message of peace. And I talked about this with mercy. It's like, we don't have mercy. We, we bring the message of mercy. We bring the message. You know, we're bringing to people what Christ has. Not what we have. Right? So, we have, to, we have to bring that message of peace. So listen to this. Now, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 20, through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's us, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. There's that reconciliation again, right? That's the end of war. 
He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world, the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, I'm going I'm to say this, and I know this will upset a lot of people. I understand what I'm doing when I say that Christians should not be out there fighting the world's wars. It's not our ministry. I'm not saying, I'm not sitting here in judgment of whether this war should be going on, that war should be going on, this action should be taken, or that action should be taken. I'm not, I'm not sitting in judgment of that. What I am saying is that Christ has called us to something different. We are called to be the peacemakers starting with making peace between those men and God. You can't do both. You can't, as a Christian, go out and shoot somebody and say that you are doing what Christ teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sorry, that's, the, you know, again, office at BibleTalk.com. I am more than happy to discuss this with you, to, to go through and answer your questions, but you if you can show me different in the Word from what Christ has taught here, blessed are the peacemakers, for we shall be called the sons of God, that our ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. You can't do both. You have to choose one or the other. And this is a problem in our world today when these demands are being placed on Christians and they are being told about you know their patriotic duty is to do these things. Let me tell you something. Your patriotic duty is to be to be submitted entirely to Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. So I ask you to pray about that, to pray and understand that there are things in the world that God has called us not to be a part of, so that we may be a part of what what he's called us to do. I, I'll tell you, I mean, Alice and I have lived in foreign countries. And for example, you know, we, we, lived, uh, we lived in Belize in Central America. When we went to Belize in Central America, we had to be submitted to governing authorities. That's right. I had to, we had to obey the speed limits. We had to register the car just the same. We had to, we had to obey all of their laws. But we were there as aliens and sojourners. We were there as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. That's right. So we couldn't vote in their elections, and you know we were there during the course of yes. many of their elections. Right. We were not allowed to vote in those elections because we were not part of that. Ambassadors. If you are an ambassador from the United States of America to France, you can't vote in their elections while you're there. You may live there year after year after year, right. but you're still, you're there as an alien and a sojourner. You are there representing a different power, a different kingdom. Jesus Christ stood in front of Pontius Pilate and he said, now remember, Pontius Pilate represents literally all of the power of the world. And he said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. Our ministry, and that was the great reconciliation, let me tell you. Our ministry is to bring the message of reconciliation into every place because our message our, our purpose in life is to bring the presence of Christ Jesus, the Prince of Peace, in every situation. Is this not what Paul said? Mm -hmm. We are a fragrant aroma, bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. And our citizenship is, is in heaven. heaven. Philippians 3.20, thank you. All right, so, so we are to imitate Christ. And that's what Paul says. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5.1 Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Back to the children, right? Yes. Jesus Christ, listen, he lived in a world that had war. He lived in a world that had conflict and strife. He, he lived in a country that was under the thumb of an occupying force. Yeah. At what point did he say, okay, let's do something about this? At what point did he say, let's get out in the street and pick it? At what point did he say, let's start a revolution? At what point did he say, well, let's, you know, let's just treat these people harshly because they treat us harshly? And then wasn't it that so many of the followers that he had, they were thinking of him as coming in to 
be in the political absolutely to take over the zealots change it. absolutely yeah. and it's one of the reasons I believe that that all of Jerusalem turned on him in that last week right. when they had accepted him you know as he came in on what we call today Palm Sunday right. you know he came in and they're they're throwing the leaves Hosanna, down palm leaves and crying out Hosanna Hosanna Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And these same people a week later are crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Because they were looking for somebody who would come and deliver them from the Romans. What Jesus Christ came to do is to deliver you from yourself, from your flesh. That's what Christ delivered you from. Because your flesh is the greatest tyrant that ever lived in your life. So we're called to bring this peace. We're called to bring peace between people. That's a fact. You know, it says in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 6, it says it. There are six things that the Lord hates. Yea, even seven are an abomination. And, and one of those, remember, these are the highlights of uh, God's abomination. One who spreads strife among brothers. Now, now think about that. That's an abomination before God. That is exactly the opposite of what Christ is calling us to do here, to bring peace, to bring reconciliation. When we go out and bring strife between brothers. You do that with gossip. Gossip is the biggest. You do that when we pass judgment. When you do that when you say, oh, did you see? Uh, we didn't see. Uh. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not the way. It, it, and it's not just between brothers. You know, in, earlier in Proverbs, Solomon said, a worthless person, a wicked man, is the one who walks with a perverse mouth, who winks with his eyes, mm -hmm. signals with his feet, who points with his finger, who will with perversity in his heart continually desire, devise evil. Who spreads strife. It's in that same chapter. We have to bring peace. You have to be so careful because it is so easy in this day and age to bring division, to bring strife. When God is calling us to bring reconciliation. We need to put a guard over our mouths. Better yet, we need to do what it says in the Psalms and ask God to put a guard over our mouths. We need to treasure that fruit of the Holy Spirit that's in our life. Before this peace, you know what? This love. Because if you don't have love, the love of God, well, you'll never have peace with anybody else. Because the only thing you'll love is yourself. And you will find that you are a more harsh taskmaster than Pharaoh ever was. And you will devise evil. That's exactly what James said, the cause of war. Because of your selfishness, your self-centeredness, your love of money, your love of pleasure. That's what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, when he talks about the perilous last days. Is It's the opposite of peace. But you have love that's been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit, Paul said in Romans 5.5. 5. So you have the power, not your own, you have the power of God within you to bring that love into every situation. You have joy that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So you can bring joy into people's lives. They can see the joy in your life in the midst of all of the conflict, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the turmoil, in the midst of the chaos. They'll see joy in you. And then they'll see peace in you. Because you, as Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, should not be troubled by what's going on in the world. He gives you a peace that passes understanding. You know what? People should be coming up to you day after day saying, why? Why is it that you're not troubled by the housing market, by the job market, by what's going on in Israel? What's, why, what's going on there? Why aren't you troubled by that? You know why? Because of Jesus. Amen. That's why. Because of Jesus. I've got peace like a river. I've got peace in my heart. Be careful today, too, of the false prophets who are out there just like they were in the time of Ezekiel, just like they were in the time of Jeremiah, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Because the world can't give you peace. You're not going to elect a politician who's going to bring peace. You're not going to fight a battle that's going to bring peace. It may bring a ceasefire, like I said, but it'll just be time to reload. The only thing that will bring peace into the lives of men is the Prince of Peace, and His name is Jesus Christ. So, Father, we just thank You, Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for the gift of peace that you've given us that might reign in our heart, Lord God, and it would be visible to others that they would be drawn to you. That through our life, everything that we do would lift up, exalt, 
your Son, Christ Jesus, because you said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Help us, Lord, to see the strife in others and bring this word of reconciliation, to bring good news, to bring light into the darkness. Father, I just ask that in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Well, until next time, may the Lord God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Bye-bye.